Hi right, guys. We're the startup that Omo mentioned. Um, we actually rushed over here from uh, the office right after, like at 6, 15, I think. In the middle, yeah. There. There go. And we have a pretty short story compared to uh, <laughs> such a fascinating um, history like yourself, Mr. Sosa. So we started out about a year ago, technically two years ago. The research and development process started two years, three years ago. And it evolved multiple times, different iterations, and then the project was canceled. It tanked. It tanked because the company went bankrupt and they cut the funding. So we decided that we'd continue. We hadn't been paid. There was nothing developed. We had already made the expense. Um, no business was developed, I mean. The technology, the electronic board, was the only thing we had designed. So version one electronic board was possibly the best thing we ever made, because we make four versions after that, and we still have to use the first one. But the point is, version one came out in 2013, officially, and that's not it, but it was, it was, um, it was quite an adventure. A lot of fail, and then eventually we made it click. We were missing one key component to making it work, uh, software. We had a partnership with an Indian company called Radmond. They work a lot with Halliburton, so we thought that they were perfect for the uh, production logging analysis, and um, realized that outsourcing your IT is possibly the worst thing that you could do. Um, to make a long story really short, this is what we do. Production logging tools is all about obtaining data. It's getting data from wells, getting data from pipelines, getting data from tanks, getting data from uh, registry tools. So you can do downhole, surface, whatever it is in your oil field that you're going to do, because that's what we work in. We work in the oil field measuring pressure, measuring temperature, measuring flow, measuring the level of tanks, in order to prevent uh, disasters, explosions, and to optimize the process of extracting oil, making it more efficient for the uh, service company to maximize the production. Because all oil wells reach a point in which they go into a production decline. Now, before I show you anything else, I'm going to explain to you something that uh, they don't teach you in the oil business, but they should. Do you have, is there a marker? I usually have a, uh, but the oil business has two sides to it. It's got the high producing wells, which are the ones that you know about, uh, Permian Basin, Eagle Ford Shale, anything that's producing over 100, over 200 barrels a day. You've got high producing gas also, anything producing in the thousands. You've got uh, the Gulf of Mexico, you've got Louisiana, you've got Oklahoma, you've got um, Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia literally has about 10,000 wells and each well produces 10,000 barrels per day. You can't compete with that. Your average Mexican well, North Mexico, will produce 100. But Mexico, for example, has 25,000 wells, but Saudi Arabia has 10,000. So the difference is enormous depending on what your reservoir looks like. So long story short, all wells have a production curve. So it starts, it curves up, and hits its climax. When it hits its climax, that's when it officially begins to decline forever. So the secret and the trend nowadays is all about revitalizing your wells, making those declines last longer because of how the market works. It's all about the price of the oil and the barrel, and um, it gets a really messy game after that. But what we do in the, after the perforation in production stage, we monitor the activity and the life of the well so that you can track the, the, the thing. So I'm going to pass this around. This is one that we got back um, a while ago from a tank. And this was a prototype from our first ones that we deployed into the market for tank monitoring. 
we also used it in a river and a dam. We have to be resourceful. We're a startup. So that one right there went through a hailstorm. It went through a, uh, a thunderstorm. It was over flooded with oil. And it passed all the tests that we hoped it would pass, but we didn't know it would pass. Kind of a risk there. So now you understand a little bit about the production process of the oil business and that it has a climax and it has a decline. And that what we do is we can maximize the well revitalization so that your well can last longer. Yeah. So basic things to, that oil companies like to monitor is pressure and temperature, because from that you can calculate your flow. Technically, pressure and temperature calculates volume. And from your differential between point 0.1 and point 0.2 and point 0.3, you can calculate your flow. Theoretical flow, but very precise, depending on the sensors that you're using. I'm assuming it's a very technical audience. OK, so a point, uh, zero 0.01 resolution on your sensor will give you some accuracy. A point zero 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 0.0001 will give you much more accuracy. Um, your high producing wells, they look for the point zero 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 0.0001 because they need to know every single drop that is coming out of that thing. Money. We didn't design a tool for that. Yeah. It's money. It's money. We didn't design a tool for that. We designed a tool that was intended for the mature well market, the people who hit the climax or already hit 10 or more years. You're a mature well. You're not producing 10,000 anymore. And if you are, you're one of the very few. You're producing 100 barrels a day, maybe 20 barrels a day. Maybe you're a rancher and you have some wells. And you want to know how much money is going out to these companies, because they're supposed to pay you on a royalty or on a commission, on a lease, depending on how the business was set up. So we entered to satisfy this market. This segment of the market was mature wells. And I emphasize that again because where the production decline. People oftentimes let one at, I, I've been approached by a few people, hey, I've got these contracts in um, the Gulf of Mexico for measuring, I mean, for extraction in, uh, in Pemex. Well, man, you need to go with a state of the art $50,000 system for that because you're producing how much barrels per day? Like 3,000, 4,000 barrels per day at least. You don't want to put one of these in there. That's going to be bad. You're going to lose a lot of money. But then you get approached by someone who has a well that produces 100 or a service company that takes care of a field. And that's our market. That's what we do. So basic pressure and temperature calculates your flow. Level lets you calculate your, well, level really just tells you how much volume you have in a tank. But why is that important? Because in the oil business, in the tank process, after the wellhead, there is the flowback system. There is, it goes through a process of separation into a tank and then ultimately into a truck that the truck takes it to a disposal site. And then another truck takes that to Exxon or Shell or Valero, whoever is going to do the um, petrochemical process. Why do what, they want to monitor the tanks? Because right now, a current problem in Eagle Ford Shale, for example, they're overflowing. And then EPA comes and fies them and suspends them. They're getting robbed in Mexico, in Eagle Ford, everywhere. It's just something that happens in the business. So this is an example of the digital oil field. Oh, OK, I've never used this. So you've got the different parts, and it's all about creating a network in which you can transmit data from the site to your server. Now, that sounds really easy. Oh, man, I'll just go put a Wi-Fi and we'll freaking transmit. That's not a problem. Well, it's harder than that because there's an explosive atmosphere around the well pad. There's an explosive atmosphere around the tank. There's an explosive atmosphere, even bigger one, on the well line. You need to be careful. They do blow up. So you have to transmit these things on safe frequencies, which are 2.4 gigahertz. OK? People do it on 433, which is radio. People do it on 900. And there have been explosions. But they still do it. Why did they transmit at all? No run a landline then. Sorry? Why did they run a landline then and transmitting dangerous? If you have cables in the oil field, there's the risk of something happening. There's also the gas 
the gas has a, um, it can trigger a spark with the transmission. And you can cause an explosion like that. Really, that simple. Yeah, the time analog is a problem because the time is longer, but also is that you have wiring on the well pad. So if anything happens, that's perfect. Like, um, let's say erosion occurs, mm, weathering. It happens. Let's say somebody dropped something and they busted a piece of that cable. Or let's say somebody just pulled the cable accidentally, or an animal came. This all happens. The thing that we do is we're wireless. We're wireless, take it, extract the information from the explosive atmosphere, put it into a, uh, what people call a remote terminal unit, and from there, upload it to the internet, satellite, radio, it doesn't matter, because it has to be outside of the... Ex the right, so 2.4, range is the biggest problem. That's why you have to set up a network within there. Um, we don't drop it down the well. See, downhole isn't what we're interested in. We're all about surface. Because if you get the aggregate data on the surface, let's say all the PTs, all the pressure temperatures, and all the levels of your surface data, you can calculate a lot of information about your reservoir. So, but if you put a tower, I mean, what's the range of, I mean, if, if you got a, a field that's very large, how many towers you got to put up around it to be able to... Each, each unit, each one of the nodes can transmit 50 meters okay. if it's using 2.4 okay. sci-fi transmission. If it's using SIGBI, for example, at 2.4 it can transmit up to 100. If it's using SIGBI 900 gigahertz, it transmits up to 600 meters. Line of sight. Line of sight is required. So what we do is we deploy these hubs right, throughout the oil field to be able to collect the data from certain points. Because well pads are interested, for example, oh, standard PCP wants two and transmit to one point. But then you have another well maybe 10 miles away. The reason I bring that up is um, I haven't done anything, but um, I know someone who's done um, uh, uh, the um, electronic uh, thing for uh, electrical um, automation. No, no, no elect um, power um, meters. Power Where they meters. Would, yeah, um, Iowa, um, Cedar Rapids uh, Co-op put a big tower up in Marion. Um, all of their meters feed right into that tower and then they collect the data that way so they don't have to go get all the meters. So the question I'm wondering, and this is familiar enough with the idea of what you're trying to do as far as the top hubs and the thing is, what kind of range can you get? Can you put one tower up in the middle of a field and collect all the data? You, you could. We don't really go into that because since mature wells, they don't have high capital investment. I mean, somebody's not going to put such a big structure right. when you have a marginal well. It wouldn't matter either if you had, I mean, if the transmission's only 600 meters and you're trying to... Yeah, well, see, uploading via satellite, you can upload from just about any site. And um, AT&T, for example, in Eagle Forge Hale, has taken care of putting all the, the places. So this is a cost-effective solution for all the people who are in the mature well market. What you're talking about is something that Slumberjay would need. But you see, Slumberjay... They'll buy a Delta V system from Emerson that costs maybe $300,000 for one site. But your average rancher right. won't do that. And actually, private companies in Latin America don't do that either. I'm going to tell you why. Our main market is Latin America. Colombia, Venezuela, Mexico. We're entering Texas. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> OK. so. We use a beagle bone, very standard tech, sent OS. Oh, wait, no, it's Debian. Yeah, that's Debian. And we can use SIGBee, sci fi. We make it adaptable. That's the processing for the alarms. That's the processing for the data. That's the storage for the data. It's required that you store on site. It's required that you store at the, at the uh, service company. It's also required that you store online. This was prototype one of the interface, when we decided that, oh, yeah, let's make a really cool software to go along with this. And we were throwing ideas down. And we really didn't know 
what this all enta entailed, but we were going by what everybody uses, graphs. And that's it for that because that was stage one. And the digital oil field in a nutshell is just, just getting data from your, from your well sites, from your processes, really, from your separators, from your tanks, from whatever processes you have active, is getting that data somewhere to make sense of it, to make information. So, and that, that's what really our business is. It's making information out of your well site. Um, These can also be solar powered. And there's different applications. Once we began to deploy, we started realizing what we are. Uplink? Do you uplink your data or do you have some guy drives around a ticket so I can download We uplink the data. Uh, we, we use uh, whatever is possible at the site. So we have some sites where you use uh, direct satellite communication. On some we use uh, GSM. Um, we got really lucky on one site and we can use 3G there, but uh, whatever wireless. So you're using these uh, whatever frequency it was just to get it far enough away and then you hop over to something like GSM? Yes. Yeah, which is why the trick is all about getting it outside of the explosive atmosphere, avoiding that disaster. That's, that's what it's all about. So at one point, the company decided this needs to be its own thing, needs to be its own little brand. So we created Safe Wireless Remote Sensor. Originally, we designed for oil fields, but our greatest demand came from water. Water management, water management in oil, water management in um, civil defense units. Like in Latin America, you have a lot of flooding that occurs. Rivers, monitoring the level of rivers over different points can help you calculate how much you need to output in your dam. Mexico City has that in Presa Marin, which I think you'll find something familiar here um, from your time. So this right here, we designed a new system, a new view, much nicer than that first thing that you saw, which was completely hand-drawn. <laughs> this one right here looks professional, and this was nice. However, this is not what we began marketing with. You have your nice tendency curves for temperature, for example, which is useful for people who are into meteorological, who care about the meteorological data, because this data might give them information about their process. Maybe my truckers aren't getting there in time because the weather's bad. Simple as that, but to be able to cross-reference that data is what this is all about. It started out as an ex executive tool, but it ended up becoming more of an operator's tool. So you can export the data, you can interact with the data, and this is the part that Joe designed, and um, he's a UTPA graduate, it's computer science, on the patent. So you want to tell him about how you did it? Sure. Uh, so with this product, uh, well, first off, I don't know we made it super clear what this is. So uh, this little guy right here, uh, when you hook it up with solar and the solar connection, uh, this is the level on it. Yeah. So this one, if we were to anchor here, it gives the level reading from here to floor, uh, with the idea being, you know, it starts flooding, you'll know. <laughs> um, these are great, but as far as the software is uh, concerned, they were a problem. For each hub we have, we have two of those. So or very more. quickly you end up with hundreds and thousands of readings per second, which uh, can be pretty problematic. Um, so for our system, which that, that line, that was the greatest thing I ever saw when I got it working. Uh, the problem with it is that it's thousands and thousands of data points uh, every day. Uh, I believe we did the math once, and in a month we receive about 70-odd uh, thousand, uh, was it 7 million? About 7 million data points. <laughs> um, so in building the system, we have to build a system that's scalable. I could. Uh, work with multiple companies. Uh, we <laughs> didn't think it through on our first time around. So all of our clients, all of our companies were logging into the same site. Uh, so anytime anyone was doing any work, uh, everybody would 
uh, feel it <laughs> since the site would come to a crawl. Um, no. One second. Yeah, so whenever we had that first kind of initial choke, we really went and reworked our system. So our initial prototype was written in Python. It was written uh, with the class framework, and it was slow, <laughs> incredibly slow. Uh, at that point, I approached Juan and asked him, you know, is it, you mind if I try something really crazy? And I used what was then a really new technology uh, called Node.js, uh, which is a JavaScript-based scripting framework, I guess? Language. Language, yeah. Uh, which would basically take JavaScript, which at the time was pretty much known as only as a web technology, and allow it to be a server. Um, since we started using it, uh, it's been picked up by some major players and made me feel a lot better about justifying that choice. But at the time, it, it was really, uh, it was a lucky guess on my part. Uh, since then, it's been, been picked up by uh, PayPal, Walmart, uh, eBay. eBay, a bunch of people whose primary interest is handling hundreds of thousands of transactions per second quickly in a redundant, fail-safe way, uh, which is primarily why we were interested in it. Uh, the way we built our system, even if there is a collapsing failure, somewhere along the line, something will catch it and we'll know about it. So. So there's a bunch of different processes that it goes through in the database. It's about three databases, and it's real time. And that's the other part about this tool. It's a real time processing system that lets you visualize in real time, and lets you process the alarms in real time, and it lets you get the alarms in real time. My pressure's too low, I'm losing money. My tank level's too high, that thing's gonna spill, I'm gonna lose money, I'm gonna send someone right now. These decisions are the simple decisions that a operator, a project manager, needs to make, but if they have the data, they can make it correctly. And that's what this was designed for, map view for logistics planning, distance calculating, cost analysis on that. that and that's it. That, that's what we do. We, we do information, and we sell information. So I'm going to show you a video. that accurately explains what we do. Is this your video? Yes. While that's playing, any questions? Right, so this is a tank application. Well pad, you can get two, at within 50 centimeters of each other, you can calculate the differential pressure and the differential flow. Works for gas, works for oil, Works for water. <coughs> Applications for flooding prevention. And that's the hub that you were uh, asking about with the solar power. Made it sustainable, made it cost effective for us. Transmit somewhere via satellite, radio, internet. Ultimately ends up on your visualization tool, your phone, your API. For those of you in the API, and for your program that you already use to monitor, we can give you the data. This is popular in oil. So that's what we do. We measure things. Real simple. Are you, uh, when, when you have a customer and they, they buy your system, are you are you taking the data and providing it to them, or are they uploading it to their own data center and their scientists? It comes down to the customer. See, there are companies like one of our customers, Ecopetrol. If you guys haven't heard of them, they're the equivalent of Pemex, but in Colombia. Now, they want the data. They say, you have a nice visualization tool, but you know, I, I have a better one. I just want the data. Give me the data. And we said, OK. Different ways of doing that. You can do it in ETL. You can do it live feed. You can give them access to yours. Ultimately, that part is so confidential to the customer that it comes down to how they want it. A service company, however, 
they don't even care. They just want to see it because they want the visualization tool. They want to know you have the data stored, and they can just see it and interact with it and play around with it. And they'll ask you for a small server that they can put in their office that can have a backup of everything, probably run on a, like a weekly update or something. But well, our primary, our primary service is uh, our primary server is running as on, on a dedicated VPS that we it, we could probably run more on it, but we choose to let it have all that space to itself. Um, it ingests the data. Uh, it forwards it to our primary backup mechanism, which is uh, Amazon's Dynamo DB. Um, that's it, it's just a really great way to store all our data, knowing that. If we have problems with Dynamo being down, there are probably people with bigger problems than us. So all uh, your compute is, you're able to do it on like a machine that you've actually got. Yes. You yes. don't actually have to talk yes. to Amazon. To no, no. Thanks. That's, pr that's no, uh, primarily done. us wanting to give our customers the peace of mind that, you know, um, even if the entire state of Texas loses power, your data is being backed up. Um, we actually, as far as our system is uh, involved, we have our primary ingestion engine, which forwards it to all the sub-client uh, servers, yeah, I guess, yeah, um, which we're currently in the process of moving them. Right now, we are using uh, DigitalOcean. They're, they're great. <coughs> Use them, guys. Uh, we're using DigitalOcean to spin up uh, droplets for each client so that they have their own sites. Virtual and, machine. Uh, virtual machines. What? where we store their data in Postgres, and uh, for any time-sensitive data, uh, things like the live graph, or if they're running analytical uh, functions on it, we throw it on Redis just for their convenience so they can perform operations faster. But uh, we, yeah, we, we're also completely open to our clients asking us, hey, I want it in this format. I want you to give me a link on this machine. I want an automated backup on that machine. We, we can handle that. Uh, just fine. Just fine. All right, buddy. You know, you know, we I've got a list of questions for you, so uh, if you don't mind, uh, what's your competition look like? Are anybody in the same price range as you? The two the same thing? Right. Okay. What makes us stay in business? Price. Price does. See, Scada is our competitor. Scada isn't a customer. Scada is a solution. Okay. People oftentimes say, "Oh, I have Scada." Like an engineer will say, "I have a Scada." Well, that just says nothing to me. Who are you paying? That says a lot, right? And SCADA is a solution that, for example, Emerson, Schneider Electric, and um, a few other major players use. SCADA is our major competitor. Anybody within the SCADA ideology is a competitor of what we do. But the thing about SCADA is that an average SCADA system will range 50K. And then your transmissions on those will range at $600 a month, plus the calibrations, which are $2,500 every time, plus the installation, which is $2,500 every unit. One SCADA can have multiple units. Every sensor that connects to it via analog, which is how SCADA does. Wires that run to a remote terminal unit, which is my hub. But it, this, in this case, it's a big thing that they put, like a little block. It's a server <laughs> on the oil field. And that is how they transmit the data. Now, that's good because precision, scalability, but it's bad if you don't have something that justifies that investment. So how many, how many of the units do you actually have deployed right now? Yeah, I should know that number. I should. I, mean, I should. Two. No, I think we have about 30 units deployed, yeah. out of which the majority of them are in... Um, uh, water, water, water applications. Canagua, for example, one meteorological Canagua level dam, Presa Marin, Mexico City. Um, that's one. In that's a bunch of them, but that's one of our accounts. And another one is in uh, Colombia, where we have uh, the CRC and the defense, civil defense for flood preventions, and we have Ecopetrol, and here we have PJP4 oil guys. You have to go into the field services ones, or do you have some model which is your boss for 
things go wrong and things go wrong. We yeah, have, yeah. Usually, uh, the main reason we're constrained to Colombia, Mexico, and Texas is because of that problem. Uh, yeah. We, we do have to have somebody in the area. Uh, well, I guess we. We, we do. Have we do. To, but we prefer to. We do. Unit will go down sometimes. It happens. There's like a eight, nine percent chance it'll happen. Um, you need to be able to respond within. I don't know. They tolerate, I think, nine percent of data loss. So if you do the math. If they're transmitting every five minutes, or every second, whatever, you have that much time to uh, make up for it. Every customer is different because of their transmission rates, but on average, you have a day or two. So that metal cylinder, is that one unit, is, is it separate from a different type of unit? Or? Yes. That one's separate. It's independent. It's a node. And you can hook up eight sensors on it, so you can get different readings. Um, um, is there a reason why it's metal instead of black pressure? See, a wellhead will dish you out 3,000 PSI, 2,000 PSI if you, know, you have one of the good customers. If you have an OK customer, still 500 PSI is a lot. You were, you were talking, uh, what, uh, 50 TOR, which is times 14. That's what, I'm sorry, my math's not the best. I studied business, <laughs> not computer science. Well, whatever the number is, it's still not as much as 3,000 PSI, um, 4,000 PSI. And, um, also, it's easy to manufacture that way, at least for us. At the end of the day, we can't manufacture 3 million just because you need money. Yes, we do. We do. We handle our manufacturing through the Philippines with a partner that we have, and we assemble here, um, and we calibrate here as well. Hey, McAllen. And do you have like a cost that you publish for you? Yeah, we do. Um, each one of those costs $800, and each one of the hubs costs $1,200. That's for your standard set. And your return on investment on those, if you rent them, let's say $300 a month, which is very doable. Market rate's 500 So let's say you go low, and you have PT customer. It'll last you a year and a half, two years. Every month it'll pay you. So you make your money back in four months or less. So my last question is, uh, so how do you handle the, you, you said that you have another unit that's outside of the explosive environment that you put so that you can put, I guess, more of your electronics up so you, so you can upload. How do you handle an oil field that, let's say, they, they've got a leasing space around the well we haven't because um, either the service company really wants us there or the landowner really wants us there. But you never have a separate part. Is there some that, you know, the landowner is one person and the guy who owns the well is another? I mean, that's a we haven't had that situation arise, actually. We can position ourselves anywhere within the radius, so it really hasn't happened. How far, how far are you going away from the actual well? Head the Whatever it needs to be. We've been as close as 10 meters to as far as 50 meters. So it all comes down to how the, the layout of the land is, you know, what they have. They have a separator in the middle, maybe. You're powering everything by solar. Solar and batteries. The batteries last a long time. It's only 50 meters away, I thought you were talking kilometers. In the, explosion, in the explosion proof solution, it can only go up to 50 because it's 2.4 gigahertz and the amount of power that you need to get farther. You can change fiber, can you? You can change fiber. Change fiber. Fiber optics. Yeah, I guess you could. I don't think they're deploying that. I haven't seen anybody do that. It's a good idea. No, it's not my idea. The army does that. They have a command post and they run fiber for a couple of kilometers so that it's all picked up remotely and you don't get bombed. Could be a cost thing. Remember, these on the oil market are on the lower end. We're on the lower end of oil. So, on so the company, how many y'all are in You two, that's it? No, no. The group is uh, about eight, nine engineers in Colombia do the electronics work and the, uh, really, that's what they do, electronic engineering. And the rest is here in McAllen and Mexico. No, we, we own them. <laughs> you own them? No, no, no. No, we own, <laughs> we own, we own the company. Uh, no, but is that... The company, are they like contracted out for a certain amount of hours every month? Or? No, no. Um, 
they are all full time in the company, and the company. <laughs> they, uh, I guess, I don't know what to say. They. Uh, yeah. 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 As well as consulting and research and development projects that we do. Today was a good day for us. We signed a deal with Ecopetrol aside from these, so developing some sort of water solution, which was nice. Not, I'm not behind that. I have a question. I'm curious to find out how is it that you got involved in such a specialty and such a particular thing? How is it that you well, went? A long story short, I had a video game league. I needed a programmer to make a website. I hired him, and I decided to quit my video game league because it was just not making me enough money. And I saw a better solution in a dead project that was abandoned in the company that I owned a part of, so I decided to get into it, and um, Joe came with me, and then we grew from there. I really don't know. We just, how did, why? Why did we get into the oil business? Right, okay. My father was a Halliburton VP and quit, decided to do R&D, research and development and consulting. However, bad business, and it, like, as an engineer, brilliant, but as a businessman, just made very poor decisions. So we always ended up on the losing side. And I needed to get out of what I was doing because I was thankfully educated by Dr. Sargent. I needed to get into business in the company and um, decided to take this project because everybody's very territorial and nobody wanted this one. So we did it. Did you have to pay royalties or something to take over the IP? Um, no. no I've there was like a hostile takeover about three months that I was displaced from my like position of controlling this entire operation. But that was done by uh, Columbia. <laughs> yeah, all the people in Columbia took care of that. <laughs> but it, it was okay. I mean, we defended our ground. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so yeah, and uh, since then we've been in? To also answer the other part of the question, we have eight engineers in Columbia doing electrical engineering and four programmers here in McAllen. Right, and one mechanical engineer in McAllen, as well as a um, field technician, oil field technician, and a company administrator. And we do software projects on the side. to find. Okay, so how did we finance this operation when this was a dead project? That was the coolest part of how we did it. We decided to take on IT projects to develop custom software for businesses for people that like to develop unique solutions for their own, like uh, suits made to their fitting. And we finance our, 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 our system like that. That's what we did for a whole year. So it's been long, but rewarding at the end. Any final questions? I have a question. So what do you think you're gonna be uh, in a year or two years with this? <coughs> oh man, right now I'm thinking, where am I gonna be in a week? And where am I going to be in a month? Entrepreneurship is horrible. I don't know. You have to go hungry, dollar menu. No. Look, um, right now I'm thinking about January. And I'm thinking about what I have right now. What we signed right now was really hard to get. I just want to do it and see what happens later. I haven't projected myself into the future because it's just, I need to, it's all about results. And in oil, it's horrible. It's on a day to day basis. You mess up one day, that's it. You just burned yourself. So, so right now we're thinking, okay, we've got good things. We signed four new contracts. Let's deliver on them. Manufacturing has been our biggest bottle head, no, bottleneck. But yeah, that's, that's it. Figures.